Greetings from CNS to all of you and a very warm welcome to everyone to this very special webinar on potentially a game-changing recommendation that came from WHO just last month. That is a shorter, cheaper MDR-TB treatment regimen. At less than 1,000 US dollars per patient, the new regimen can be completed in 9 to 12 months. Not only is it shorter and cheaper than the current regimens, but is also expected to improve outcomes and decrease mortality due to better adherence to treatment and reduce loss to follow-up. Today in this webinar, we have those very experts who have been on the front line of research and development of this new MDR-TB treatment, as well as those fighting TB in high burden countries like India. As we all know, unless we detect drug resistance early on and treat drug resistant TB with effective drugs without delay, our countries will not be able to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs as they are better known as. One of the SDGs is to end TB by 2030. The WHO end TB strategy also reinforces this goal. WHO estimates that 5% of all TB cases are multi-drug resistant. This translates into almost half a million cases and 190,000 deaths each year. About 9% of MDR-TB patients developed XDR-TB, that is extremely drug resistant TB, which is even more difficult to treat. We already have WHO recommended novel rapid diagnostic test aim to speed up detection of drug resistant TB and now comes a better treatment regimen as well. We must not delay the rollout of this new MDR-TB regimen. There are several examples where rollouts of new treatment options, drugs or diagnostics have been marred with long preventable and avoidable delays. For example, the pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP approved by US FDA in July 2012 is yet to be rolled out in several countries to reduce risk of HIV transmission in zero discordant couples. Even the daily drug regimen for drug sensitive TB is not available for all those in need of it. Access is a major issue and we do hope the new shorter and cheaper MDR TB treatment will reach all those people who are eligible for it without any avoidable or preventable delay. Shorter, cheaper MDR-TB treatment is surely a big step forward. And we must, I repeat, we must ensure that all those who need care are able to get the standard treatment, care and support services without delay. Before we actually move on to the panelists, let me make a few quick announcements. Our lead moderator from South African Broadcasting Corporation Mr. Ashok Ramsarup has undergone a major surgery and is recuperating. So we will be missing him on this webinar and do hope he is healthy and back online in the next month's webinar. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait. Just type your questions using the chat function or raise your virtual hand which you will see on your screen during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that we have good time left for question and answer. Thanks for your co cooperation. Without any further ado, let me hand over to our first panelist, Dr. I.D. Rasan, Senior Vice President, Research and Development, International Union Against TB and Lung Disease, the Union, who leads the Treat TB, Treat TB Initiative which coordinated the stream clinical trials for shortened MDR-TB treatment regimen. Over to you, Dr. Rosen. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here with everybody today. Um, I, and and I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, go first, because what I hope to do is to give you a little background of the, the story and the history which, uh, which has led to uh, uh, the development of new recommendations, which I'll let my uh, colleague from WHO discuss further. Um, I have been asked to limit uh, my uh, 
uh, presentation to 10 minutes and uh, was also asked to have some slides for you to look at. Um, some of those slides would take longer than 10 minutes to go over in detail, but I hope they'll serve as a, as a background uh, for you. So uh, don't be alarmed if I, if I go quickly over one or two of these slides. Um, they're, they're really for your reference. Um, next slide, please. Um, so briefly, I think my, my uh, other colleagues will also touch upon this, but uh, it is important to, to touch upon um, uh, the, the shortcomings of the current treatment. And then really to take you back um, several years to the union's involvement in, uh, in research on shortened MDR-TB regimens, um, which started with a, a pilot project in Bangladesh uh, many years ago. Um, then I'd like to touch upon the two main areas of research that the union has been involved with related to shortened uh, MDR-TB treatments and uh, briefly uh, uh, direct you to, to a useful resource uh, for other treatment shortening research. So with that brief outline, um, we can go on to the next slide. Um, Next slide, please. Thank you. So, so as has already been said, um, you know the the uh, almost half million cases or estimated cases of MDR-TB globally in 2014 is, is quite a, a, a large uh, number and uh, and an important burden. I think what's even more important is that only a quarter of these estimated cases are detected and treated. Um, so, really, that's uh, that's saying a, a huge. Uh, um, it's really marking a huge gap that, that we have uh, this number of cases, but we aren't able to even reach uh, and treat a quarter of those. And maybe more striking is the fact that of MDR-TB patients who are treated with the current treatment, only 50% are treated successfully. So you could flip a coin as to, as to whether you'll, you'll be successful in your treatment using the current treatments. And finally, again, more striking is, is how intolerable the current treatments are. Um, there's, there's many uh, um, uh, uh, markers of this. Um, you know, one of them is, is, is the figure that 14,000 tablets or pills have to be taken by a patient in order to complete the current regimen. Uh, some of the side effects, such as uh, hearing loss, are, are really um, debilitating and uh, uh, you know, it's something that we need to, to uh, improve and avoid um, uh, if, if we're going to make um, a treatment manageable for for affected uh, communities. And next slide, please. So the union for a long time has believed that, that a more accessible and tolerable treatment for MDR-TB was urgently needed. And, and back in 2005, 2006, there was a pilot program in Bangladesh utilizing a nine-month treatment regimen. And one of our union colleagues, Dr. Armand Van Dun from uh, the Institute of Tropical Medicine, uh, was working with the Damien Foundation and reported to the union on the success of this uh, treatment. Next slide, please. And so this is just, again, for your reference, is, is you know, now famously called the Bangladesh Regimen. But this is the uh, the medicines that are included in that regimen. Uh, and I think the important thing to note is this wasn't a regimen based on new treatments, but based on existing medicines and using some, uh, we say repurposed, but medicines that are used for other purposes that were used successfully in this regimen. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so it's a little difficult to see on the bottom. I'm not sure. Anyway, the bottom is just a reference for that first uh, published uh, uh, article of the uh, f cohort of 206 patients in Bangladesh. The, the important thing to note was that the reported success rate of 87.9% compared to the 50% I mentioned earlier was really quite striking. Of course, that was early days and this feeling that more patients had to be followed for a longer period of time to be more confident in those results. If you click it just once, it should take us to the next um, update. Thank you. So when the updated uh, results were published in 2014, there were now over 500 patients and again, an overall treatment success rate of almost 85%. Next slide, please. However, the reality was that these results were coming from one setting, one country, um, one patient population, and the feeling was that in order to make um, wider use of such a regimen, additional evidence was needed. And this is where the union um, took on a, a parallel approach in terms of evaluating these shortened regimens and uh, conducted both cohort a study or observational study of the regimen in other settings, as well as uh, a randomized clinical trial, which is still underway. So I'll just touch on both of those uh, different approaches. Um, the next slide, please. 
So again, the additional cohort approach um, uh, was uh, done in uh, West Africa. It was funded by the French Development Agency um, and coordinated by the Union. And it's an observational study of a thousand patients on a regimen very similar to the Bangladesh regimen. There's minor changes made due to the availability of, of one of the medicines. And I think it's important to note that an observational study is one where there's not a direct comparison. So it's not uh, comparing side by side a patient on uh, the Bangladesh regimen or the, the shortened regimen to the standard of care. Rather, it's following a large group of patients who are treated on this regimen, monitoring them closely, following them to see how they do in terms of side effects, uh, and importantly, how they do in terms of treatment outcomes. And you'll see there are the nine countries that are participating in this study. Well, at last year's Union Conference in December in Cape Town, uh, an interim analysis was presented of the first 408 patients with results available and demonstrated a treatment success of 82.1%. So again, very successful treatment rates compared to what we'd previously seen in MDRTB. And this is important, of course, because it's a new population, a new uh, region, and importantly, there was uh, um, HIV infected patients included in this uh, in this population, which wasn't the case in the Bangladesh experience. Next slide, please. At the same time, the gold standard for evaluating new treatments is a randomized controlled trial where patients are randomly selected to receive either uh, the existing or a control treatment or a new or uh, uh, often experimental treatment. And so the union back in 2008 was successful in securing funding from the United States Agency for International Development or USAID and partnering with the Medical Research Council in the United Kingdom, we were able to initiate the STREAM clinical trial. Next slide, please. So the STREAM trial is, is really a randomized trial comparing a modified Bangladesh regimen compared to what's locally used in participating countries based on d d previous WHO guidelines. Next slide, please. And this is just showing you where the stage one or the first part of the trial uh, took place. You see it's in four countries um, spread out throughout the world. Next slide, please. And so we were aiming to enroll 400 patients in this trial and had successfully enrolled 424 patients before the uh, enrollment was closed. We just finished enrollment last July, a year ago. One of the challenges of clinical trials is it takes a long time. It takes a long time to enroll the patients and it takes a long time to follow up patients for the necessary time before you're, you're able to assess uh, whether the, uh, the treatment was effective. So the results for this stage one will not be available till early 2018, which is one of the challenges uh, in terms of um, um, evaluating the existing data. Next slide, please. But in an exciting um, um, step forward, the trial team also was able to consider adding additional treatment regimens to the trial. So we now are starting a second stage of STREAM where we're also evaluating a nine-month regimen that does not have an injection at all, and that's one of the biggest problems with existing treatments, um, both in terms of discomfort for patients but also in terms of a side effect like hearing loss. And we're also evaluating an even shortened regimen of six months. Uh, and both these regimens are including the new drug, Bedaquiline, which has been uh, um, uh, provided uh, with uh, support from Janssen Pharmaceuticals uh, as part of this evaluation. Next slide. So we have just begun stage two of this trial in March of 2016. We have 10 patients enrolled out of a, of a planned enrollment of 1,155. So again, it's a very uh, a long trial, um, one that's uh, very complex and will, and will require uh, up to 10 countries uh, in order to meet that uh, recruitment target. And uh, the initial results are expected really uh, in 2020, towards the end of 2020. Next slide, please. So given the time constraints, I just wanted to highlight that there are 
other clinical research studies that are planned or underway, including several clinical trials. And this is a big step forward to the field. In the past, there were no trials underway, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why guidelines are having to be made without clinical trial evidence. I just want to refer people to the Resist TB website. Resist TB is a research network um, led by Dr. Bob Horsberg and uh, um, several uh, global partners, and uh, they have an excellent uh, clinical research or clinical trial uh, progress tracker, which enables you to see all the trials that are underway, how many patients they've recruited, what medicines they're testing, and it's a really viable resource that I would refer people to. Next slide, please. So, so in conclusion, the union has done a fair bit in terms of evaluating shortened regimens uh, up to now, and we, we think this is really key as new medicines become available to assess their impact um, in program settings. Uh, and uh, we also think it's very important to, uh, to build the capacity of programs to be able to participate in these research efforts uh, to evaluate regimens um, in order to, to uh, be able to undertake all the research that is required. So with that, I will uh, stop. I look forward to hearing uh, my fellow panelists and to uh, fielding any questions you may have uh, in the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rasan. There was some internet problem at my end. Thank you very much, and I'm sure we will be having many questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we move on to our next panelist, Dr. Fuad Mirzaev, Medical Officer, Labor Laboratories, Diagnostics, and Drug Resistant Unit, WHO Global TB Program. Over to you, Dr. Forth. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm trying to share my screen now. Yes. I think yes. It's working, right? Yes, we can see it. We can, yes, we can see it, doctor. Great. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, webinar. And um, I hope I can provide uh, some further details on WHO recommendations. And uh, I'm really thankful for previous speaker for Dr. Rusen for um, talking uh, more in detail about the shorter regimen and uh, the string trial. So uh, I, I will also try to fit into 10 minutes um, and um, I'll go <coughs> through the, the uh, before presenting you the, uh, the actual WHO recommendations on the shorter regimen. I will try to, 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 to go through uh, together with you the, the process that led to that recommendation uh, and uh, the, also uh, the way uh, WHO develops these recommendations and uh, what uh, the recommendation actually means. Um, and uh, at the end I will also um, uh, try to, um, to discuss a few points related to the way algorithm for the choosing of the straight treatment regimen for the patients with confirmed uh, refund resistant or MDRTB. So uh, to start with, the, uh, um, the shorter recommendation for the shorter MDRTB regimen is not the only one. There are several new things in the new uh, WHO uh, guidance on MDRTB. One of them is the shorter regimen. Uh, there is uh, a couple of uh, additional ones that uh, uh, are probably worthwhile to note is uh, about the medicines that are used in the design uh, of uh, the conventional MDRTB regimen. Regimen there is a suggested new uh, regrouping of uh, these medicines with this certain shifts in, in in the previous grouping. For example, the the clofazimine and linezolid are moved basically up from the group five. Uh, and uh, PAS so, uh, or PASS uh, have been uh, moved down to, to uh, and considered it to be a less useful drug in, the, in, uh, in building the MDR, the conventional MDR-TB regimen. The um, MDR-TB treatment uh, in these new guidelines is now recommended for all patients with refund resistant tuberculosis 
Uh, you, you may remember that in the previous guidelines there were certain variations of the treatment for patients with a monorefund insulin resistance. The, uh, there are recommendations uh, uh, related to the uh, childhood tuberculosis, uh, childhood tuberculosis with refund insulin resistance. And uh, also there is an, a recommendation that adds some evidence in, in, in form uh, uh, some evidence to, to the recommendation on the role of the surgery uh, in uh, and use of the surgery in, in treatment of uh, drug resistant tuberculosis. Uh, to make sure that you, you all understand what, this, what is the process of, uh, of getting to those recommendations and uh, um, let me just go through this slide and I'm sure this slide will be available after uh, uh, as I, I can't spend too much time on that but it's a lengthy process, the, the, the WHO policy formulation because it's, it has multiple steps and uh, st that starts with the member states partner agencies um, and uh, um, presenting the issue or coming with a, some evidence that suggests the need for the new policy or the policy change. The following step involves the review of available evidence often through a systematic review of available data. The other step is the convening of the expert group which is the external uh, expert group with experts uh, that, uh, that WHO brings together from uh, experts in, in that particular field and uh, the group uh, um, looks at the, both the quality and the strength of, of the evidence and uh, uses the currently agreed uh, 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 a staple of WHO policy review process which, which is called GRADE the process for evidence synthesis. Then recommendations of the expert group might be presented for the, uh, for the group in, uh, that is convened by the Global TB program which is called the TB Stack, the TB Strategic uh, and Technical Advisory Group for strategic advice and only then WHO formulates policy statements which are submitted to the Guidelines Review Committee which is standing committee within WHO that uh, looks at the compliance of this policy with WHO requirements before this policy is disseminated to the member states for, with plans for promotion with stakeholders and fund, uh, funders as well as with the plan for phase and implementation and scale up. So fairly lengthy uh, process uh, uh, that is required. The, talking about the grade evaluation, the grade evaluation takes into account patient values preferences, the use of resources and also looks at the balance between benefits, harms and burdens. Quality of evidence is obviously in the heart of this evaluation. The recommendations that come out of, the, uh, of this great evaluation process can be strong or conditional and they, these uh, recommendations have different implications for different groups, for patients, care providers and policymakers. So like you, you see uh, uh, the perspective on, on, on this slide for different and implications for different users and it is really different while where strong recommendations uh, means for patients that most of the individuals would, would, uh, would want this recommended course of action and only very small proportion would not with conditional recommendation it, it's, it's different. The, the, uh, uh, the majority of the individuals in, in this situation would want the suggested course of action but many may not to go through that so the, the strength of recommendation that is indicated uh, uh, in the recommendation itself is, is a fairly important part of it. There is also a, a value of the certainty of the evidence uh, that yeah, the certainty of the evidence which, uh, which is uh, 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 classified as high, moderate, low uh, or very low in the great process. Where the, um, the, for the very low it's unfortunate but the, uh, while the recommendation is still made, the estimate of effect is very uncertain and it, 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 it obviously improves with the, with the low, moderate and high where the further research is very unlikely to change the confidence in the estimate of, of the effect. 
So just stepping back, and I think Dr. Rusin has already mentioned that the, the well, the, the shorter regiment, the Bangladesh regiment, was already used first in one country, then in multiple countries. The WHO uh, position on, on this has evolved as well. Uh, so looking at back at the history, uh, it is important to note that uh, the, while the evidence was being collected, this regiment was encouraged to be used in well-organized operational research conditions. Now, recently, with the new uh, guidelines for MTRTB, this has changed, and uh, because these, these regimen, uh, shorter MDRTB regimens were used in, if you look, we look globally, in, in these countries, and I think it, it was mentioned uh, by, uh, by the previous presenter, and some countries, uh, two, four, are now taking part in the clinical trial, so-called the STREAM trial. So we are looking very much to see the results of that trial and also the results of, of new data coming uh, from, from, from the countries. So the evidence uh, that was reviewed for the, uh, before deciding on the recommendations for the shorter MDRTB regimen uh, uh, was uh, based uh, on the meta-analysis of shorter MDRTB regimens uh, in 1,205 patients in nine countries that you see on, the, on, on, on this slide. The treatment uh, successes, the, the outcomes were very encouraging with 84% uh, uh, versus uh, the, the 62 or I mean, the range of between 53 and 70% in the comparable uh, selection of uh, MDR TB regimens for MDR patients. The, um, from patients who didn't complete treatment successfully, 7% died, 6 were lost to follow-up, and 3% had treatment failure. Uh, the relapse uh, was not completely assessed in the studies reviewed. Uh, in, in two countries, it was uh, at, assessed at 24 months uh, after treatment in one uh, other 12 months. And relapse was only observed uh, to, uh, in only small number of, of patients, in three patients out of those uh, number of patients that were reviewed. So here comes the, the recommendation, actual recommendation on MDR-TB regimen, where uh, it, it, you see that in patients with rifampicin resistant or MDR-TB that have not been uh, previously treated with second-line drugs and in whom resistance to quinolones and second-line injectable agents has been excluded or is considered highly unlikely, a shorter regimen of 9 to 12 months may be used instead of a conventional regimen. Again, as I said before, based with all that background, please pay attention that it's conditional recommendation with very low certainty in the evidence at the moment, at the time that recommendation was made. There are certain, a couple of important remarks uh, related to the shorter regimen in the current recommendation that it's, it is standardized regimen, so limited modifications are permissible. So because it was evaluated as a package, the recommendations also goes as a package for this regimen, uh, as you see on, on this slide. It applies to adults, children, and people living with HIV, <clears throat> and it is uh, uh, the, the test for resistance to quinolones or second-line injectable drugs is very much encouraged um, and uh, in, in conjunction with these uh, uh, um, guidelines, the, the, as you know, there was also a, a recommendation on the use of second-line uh, LPAs to the second-line drugs that can facilitate and, and accelerate the testing for both quinolones and second-line injectables. It has, as indeed our moderator said, has lowered costs because basically the, the, the amount of drugs and the, the length of the regimen is almost half of the conventional regimen, so it is estimated that it can be less than $1,000 in drug cost on patients. We have um, some uh, uh, information of the potentially lower, much lower than $1,000 uh, costs of, of the full regimen. And uh, the monitoring for effectiveness for uh, relapse and harms the, it still needs to be done using the active TB drug safety monitoring and management. And uh, we are looking forward for the trial, a stream trial, to provide high, higher certainty evidence that we have at the moment.
The, the very last uh, slide in, 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 in my presentation, I, I thought to, to focus on the, the, the kind of algorithm or the, the step uh, uh, that needs to be taken by, uh, by clinicians, countries, uh, sites, while choosing the treatment regimen in patients with confirmed rifampicin resistant or MDR TB, and especially when deciding on putting patient on the shorter MDR TB regimen, the, the following questions should be answered. Whether there is a confirmed resistance or suspected ineffectiveness of a medicine in a shorter TB regimen, uh, whether the patient was exposed to more than uh, one second line medicine for more than one month, whether there is an intolerance to, to uh, to, to more than one medicine uh, in the shorter regimen, risk of toxicity, whether they, uh, there is a, someone is pregnant or there is an extra, extra pulmonary disease, and only when all of these questions are answered as no, someone ha can be put on the shorter MDRTB regimen. While then, if something happens, if it fails, there is a drug intolerance, etc., the if any of these questions is answered as yes. The, someone should go into the conventional and actually not the standardized individualized MDR-TB regimen. So with this short presentation I want to thank you all for your attention and uh, uh, I would uh, let uh, the floor back to moderator and the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fuad, and thank you especially for listing out so carefully the exclusion and inclusion criteria because many of our participants had already been asking questions, have been sending their questions on this, but you have spelt it out so very clearly. Now, last but not the least, we have with us Dr. Sunil Kaparde, Deputy Director General of the Revised National TB Control Program, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, India. Dr. Kaparde leads India's TB program, a country that has the highest TB burden and a very high drug-resistant TB burden as well. Let us hear from him what does the new shorter, cheaper treatment regimen mean for India. Over to you, Dr. Kaparde. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, just I would like to tell that uh, as you very well documented that uh, and said also that India is having, having the highest burden of the TB in the world itself. It is having 2.2 million cases in the, every year. At the same time, we are having the highest burden of the MDR TB that is 72,000 estimated cases are there. And every year we are about 28,000 are treated uh, uh, to this particular to MDR TB cases. Uh, this particular new drug regime that is the shorten the treatment for the multi drug resistance TB from two years to nine months has been recommended by WHO. This is very rational for the India, as as, uh, as, as I am telling. Reason is that uh, it is uh, one of the very uh, as you know the conventional uh, TB treatment that is for the MDR TB is 18 to 24 months to complete, and it has only the 50 percent of the cure rate. And these are largely the patients find it very difficult to uh, keep the treatment for a long period with the second line drugs, which are quite to toxic also. And also prolonged period for the treatment is itself is uh, adherence becomes a problem itself and interrupt the treatment. And that's uh, one of the very important uh, when they are lost to follow up. And that was also contributed for the uh, your cure rate itself. And uh, as you secondly, I just want that if the, this particular new regime or this uh, uh, of the shortened treatment, if we just uh, started in India, uh, it will be definitely help for uh, reducing uh, the or adder because it will be the big main problem is the adherence to the treatment, and that uh, that will be sort out the problem. And second, uh, it is as you as as if you see the cost wise also, uh, if you see the cost of the Total treatment uh, in the short treatment is uh, US 1000 uh, per patient uh, as compared to the uh, conventional treatment for 24 months, it will be more than 3000 US dollar uh, per patient. And this is the most cost effective for India itself if the duration as 
because in India the, there are social factors which are also attributing the accessibility, geographical uh, uh, challenges because the country is uh, having very difficult terrain and labor problem where the patient is losing his uh, labor every day. So in such situation if you see the duration if you reduce that will definitely help in the country uh, for the uh, reducing the, uh, the uh, disease burden. Secondly, I would like to say India is already endorsed for the NTB strategy, as you very well know, and uh, we are already uh, develop our milestones and goals and objectives also. Under this, the MDR is one of the very important priority, and we are a big challenge in the country itself. And MDR TB, we are already developed the, some milestones how to be a good farmer. For which we have already developed the second line, first line DST. Uh, DST is also being carried out under the program, and we are even 67 laboratories already set up in the country itself, which can take care for the MDR TB follow up patient. Uh, out of the 67, at least about the 37 are already having the second line, uh, second line drug uh, resistance we are doing, and we are scaling up. At the end of the, this year, at the 40th, uh, 40th, this will be at least helpful for getting a good um, follow up the patient. And also, I would like to sh say that this second, uh, this particular regime will be not only the rational but more economical for us, and it is the most cost effective. And uh, we, before we start, as you know very well, that this particular trial has not been conducted in the most of in the as a Format trial has not been conducted, clinical trial has not been conducted. But in various countries, this particular regime has been started. And they have shown the very good result, more than 80% of the cure rate. And that is one of the very positive uh, factor. And uh, we have seen that uh, this particular, uh, if you see uh, other, other aspect of the drugs also, uh, of this uh, the therapy, this will definitely be helpful for the country itself. And we, before we start, we will uh, put up this particular regime in front of our expert committee. That is, uh, we are just having expert committee for the newer drug. And there we will just uh, uh, put up this particular uh, proposal to the, this uh, in front of the expert committee. And after that, uh, we will see that uh, other factor, other, uh, other, uh, other things uh, which is required for implementing or uh, rolling out this particular new drugs in the country like we have to develop the national guideline, uh, we have to update our guideline also, and training also, and healthcare personnel and drug requirement system uh, we will set up. So this will be only done after our expert committee has given the opinion that go through for this particular thing, uh, for the new drug, uh, drug uh, regimen for a shorter, drug, shorter uh, period. So this will be uh, our uh, view, and uh, I just would like to say that uh, this is the most uh, rational for the country itself and we will move forward uh, for this particular uh, shorter uh, drug regime and uh, the uh, government of India is also committed and uh, we uh, our, we are already initial talk with our, uh, um, our directory of health services and we are very soon we are calling this meeting in the, for the implementing this uh, just to putting this proposal and for implementing the shorter drug regime uh, proposal. Thank you very much. Any question, if you are asking, that we will just take up. Thank you, Dr. Kaparde. Thank you very much for informing us about so many things about the India uh, MDR-TB program. Now we begin the question and answer session. Uh, participants, please keep on sending your questions. We have a lot, many questions with us. Uh, we have uh, Tabassum Barnagarwala from Indian Express. Tabassum, would you like to ask your question yourself? Uh, Tabassum, are you there? Tabassum wants to know what is the biggest challenge in treating pediatric cases suffering from MDR and XDR TB in India? And does the RNTCP need any modification in their program for this? 
I think Dr. Kaparde would be able to answer that. Challenge in treating pediatric cases of MDR-TB. Uh, as far as the pediatric TB is concerned, definitely there are challenges in diagnosis as well as for treatment also. First challenge is that, as you know, the diagnostic challenge is, as you know, that uh, put a microscope, you will not be, uh, give the uh, correct pictures in the, and uh, very difficult for to get the samples also for, uh, because the children have their own difficulty of exposure. For which the already the government or r and program has uh, upfront the gene expert for the pediatric patient itself. And this will be definitely help. And most of the pediatric studies which has already done in a bigger hospital with the help of the private sectors also. And uh, uh, where we are trained how to collect the samples for the expert. And that itself shows that very good results we have shown. And we are got a very good number of uh, MDR as well as the uh, TB patients uh, through the expert. So this, this is a diagnostic challenge can be sorted out with the expert. But at the same time, its treatment uh, challenge is there because in India, we don't have the formulation, WHO formulation for the uh, FD, uh, FDC and uh, uh, that is a very, uh, uh, drugs are not, uh, only one uh, company that is, uh, McLeod has already uh, registered for with the DCGI. But uh, at the same time, the, there is no competitor. And availability of the drug is not available uh, with the FDCs, which is recommended by WHO as for the weight band. And that is a big challenge. And uh, very soon, we are just uh, starting the pediatric drug treatment through the uh, fixed dose combination daily raising. Uh, and we are just, uh, we are already ordered from the, uh, we are just ordering from the GDF, the global uh, drug facility. And they are having availability of this drug. So once uh, this particular procurement process will be sorted out, we are going to start for adult as well as for children uh, this uh, fixed dose combination. Thank you. So this is your problem. Uh, this is your thank question. You. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have Brian from the European AIDS Treatment Group. Uh, Brian, would you like to ask your question? Uh, Brian, are you there? Uh, Dr. Shukla? Yes. Uh, so it's ID losing. I was just going to make a follow-up point to the pediatric uh, question, if possible. Yes, please, please. Yeah, yes. I, I, just yes, wanted to please I, I just wanted to highlight that, that another very important issue is uh, the inclusion of, of pediatric populations in the research. And, and the union was just involved co-hosting a, uh, a meeting last week in Washington on uh, MDR-TB trials in pediatrics. And I think the, the issue is there's no treatment trials currently underway focused on children. And, and so there's an urgent need to, uh, to fund and implement trials that specifically target the population so we can determine what the best treatment would be for pediatrics uh, rather than trying to just extrapolate from what we find in adult populations. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Rasan, because uh, we had Homa Mansoor from MSF who really wanted to know if children were also included in the stream trial. So, uh, right. that's so, uh, so. in fact, you have answered the questions. <laughs> sure, just to say that in the stream, in stream stage one uh, trial, so currently there are not people under 18 included, though we have tried, and, and we will continue to explore lowering the age range so that they can be included uh, in, in later stages of the trial. But that is an urgent need. Thank you. Uh, Brian, would you like to ask your question? Sorry for that interruption. Fine. This is Brian Teixeira. Um, I'm particularly interested in HIV TB co-infection. So one of my questions is just to get a sense of you mentioned about the 480,000 people around the world, uh, Dr. Rusin. Do you have a sense of, and we've just heard that India is the one with highest burden, but it would be helpful to know what are some of the other high burden countries? And then a related question to that, because of my interest, and I might as well say it now, is around uh, whether HIV, people with HIV are included in the stream study. So one is just a demographic one and one about right. 
So, so Brian, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to first speak on the stream uh, the the, uh, the stream trial and the inclusion. Then maybe I'll ask my WHO colleague to talk about the the burden ac across different countries, um, since that's definitely their area of expertise. Um, so, in the stream trial, we definitely are including HIV populations, and in fact, that was one of the one of the main um, drivers of the trial was to look at at populations that weren't included in the Bangladesh experience. So um, that's why we have uh, trial sites in South Africa and in, and in Ethiopia to ensure that we will have a, a sufficient number of HIV positive patients in, in the trial. Uh, similarly, in the, in the next stage of the trial, we are, are um, stratifying or ensuring that we have a, a, a sufficient HIV uh, positive uh, population to be able to answer those important questions in that subgroup. Uh, well, this is Fuad Mirzaev. If you um, want me to, to add on, on the burden of the disease, I think uh, w without wasting too much time from, from, from this webinar, I would just say that the, the uh, AMBLE data is available in the latest uh, global TB report. But if when we are talking about MDR-TB, the estimates for uh, MDR-TB globally are among all estimated number of cases is about uh, 480,000 uh, uh, people that uh, are suffering from MDR-TB. And if all uh, uh, pulmonary TB patients notified by countries to WHO, because this is different, this is notifications versus the estimates, if all notified would have been tested, uh, the, the, uh, based on the uh, estimate about among notified, about 300,000 of MDR cases would have been identified. 60% of these cases would be in the so-called BRICS countries alone, in Brazil, Russian Federation, India, China, and South Africa. But for, for more details, because that can, that's a, a, the long uh, uh, discussion, you, you can find uh, more details in the Global TV report published uh, uh, on the WHO website. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have Rajita Bhavaraju, a senior lung health advocate from India. Uh, Rajita, would you like to ask your question? Uh, Rajita, can you hear me? Are you there? Rajita wants to know how is success measured in looking at new regimens? Is it more than just the cure rate? How, how, or on what parameters do we judge it? Are there other parameters? beyond the cure rate. So, I mean, I, I can say something first if others want to chime in. I think that obviously um, the, the cure rate or the success of the treatment is, 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 is the, the arguably the most important factor because if a treatment isn't successful, then it's, it's not worth considering further. However, clearly there are other issues that need to be considered. And for example, in the STREAM trial, one of the important outcomes is the proportion of patients who, who experience severe adverse effects or bad side effects from the treatment. So that needs to be an important factor that's evaluated in, in new treatments. And the other point that I think is very important is the health economics piece and it's been referred to by a number of speakers um, uh, earlier uh, in the webinar. Um, so for example in the STREAM trial we're working with the uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine to, to uh, evaluate the health economics of the new regimens both in terms of cost to patients and their families but also to the health system. Um, so that's another really important uh, indicator to be assessed when considering new regimens. Um, and um, we've talked a little bit about the cost of the regimen, but just to highlight that those drug, those costs that were mentioned, whether it be 3,000 versus 900, uh, in terms of the cost difference between the, the regimens, uh, it's important to know that those are just drug costs. And so many of the important costs are health system costs and obviously uh, implementing a much longer regimen uh, with a, a longer period of, of daily injections um, are all things that uh, would increase the cost to, to the health system. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we have Aarti Dhar, a very senior journalist from India. 
Aarti, would you like to ask your question? Aarti Dhar. Aarti, are you there? She has sent a question. She wants to know if India is part of the stream trial, stream, stream study, and if yes, how many patients are involved or will be involved? I think Dr. Khaparde would be able to answer that. Uh, India is not a part of stream study itself, and uh, that's why there is no question of uh, how many patients okay. are there in stream study. Okay. Uh, we, so, okay. Thank you. Sorry, if I yes, could, if yeah. I if I could add, Dr. Karpati, that yeah. I think we we have Dr. Karpati is right that, that India does not participate in, in in the first stage of stream, though we've had uh, many many um, um, constructive discussions with with the various committees uh, in India, and and uh, the uh, stream stage two has been favorably reviewed by the uh, Central Drug Authority um, in India, and so we are hopeful that that we may be able to move forward in collaboration with uh, uh, Dr. Karpati and the program um, in the future. But currently, there there uh, as, as Dr. Karpati correctly said, there are no patients in the trial from India. Uh, we have Dr. Paul Nunn with us. Dr. Paul, would you like to ask your question? Dr. Paul? Do Dr. Paul Nunn, are you there? He, uh, Dr. Paul Nunn wants to know if gatifloxacin be used instead of moxifloxacin in the shorter regimen. So, so I'm not sure who would be best to answer that. I mean, I think just to, to highlight again to uh, in, in the slide I showed the Bangladesh regimen, it, it included gatifloxacin uh, as, as the mm -hmm. fluoroquinolone in the regimen. When we undertook the stream trial, and I think uh, it's currently the situation that it's it's very difficult, if not impossible, to obtain a quality assured gatafloxacin uh, globally, and so uh, that's why it's now called the modified Bangladesh regimen, uh, whereby a substitute uh, is used, moxifloxin is used in the regimen. I, I understand there have been some discussions uh, or, or consideration about whether in the future gatafloxin would become a, an option again, but uh, as it stands currently, that's not uh, the the uh, situation for the STREAM trial at least, and I don't know if any of the uh, other panelists have a, a different view. Okay. It's just what we died. Sorry, I was on mute, uh, was trying to speak, but uh, I think uh, Dr. Rusan had uh, answered that question. Um, fully, it's it's availability of the gatifloxacin that is virtually impossible to get it, uh, at all uh, because of the issues with uh, the, the 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 toxicity at some some years ago that uh, basically um, uh, led to, to 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 kind of no no uh, companies pre making this um, drug available so that that therefore the moxifloxacin has. Uh, uh, is being used to, to, to replace gatifloxacin in, in, uh, in the shorter regimen. So that's based on availability, mostly. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Jeel Sasari from the Global Fund. Dr. Sasari, are you there? Would you like to ask a question? Dr. Jeel? Uh, yeah, hello. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. Uh, hi, ID. Hi, Shoba. Um, thank you very much for these presentations. No, just wondering if um, the shorter regimen will uh, hopefully lead to less infection within the community, less MDRTB infection within the community, or if there won't be any change compared to the uh, current uh, treatment 
uh, regimen? And if yes, if this has been estimated in terms of number of uh, reduction, I mean, in the infections. Thank you. Well, this is for Admir Zayev. Perhaps I can take the take the first uh, step, and then others can add uh, from the panel. But uh, I, there was no specific calculations that were made in terms of uh, reduction of infection in the community. But the the, the shorter regimen, um, the hope is that the shorter regimen might be used in 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 in, in more patients that are eligible for that regimen and it should lead to, to in the same rate of decreasing infections when, when the regimen is effective in MDR patients as with the conventional regimen, just logically, I don't have evidence uh, specifically for that at, at the moment, but uh, the, the hope is that uh, actually more patients will, will, will be able to stay on treatment given it, that it's shorter and complete treatment uh, in a shorter amount of time, so that can lead to, to some changes uh, potentially. But uh, again, uh, I don't have any data to, to support this. Uh, thank you. Arti Dhar wants to ask a question, I think. I think Arti Dhar is there. Arti, would you like to ask your question? Arti Dhar, can you hear me? Please unmute yourself, Arti, and then you can ask. Arti's question is that the symptoms of TB and silicosis are very similar. She says she had traveled to Rajasthan recently and met many silicosis patients who had been treated for TB for years before being diagnosed with silicosis. Uh, so what, what, uh, what steps are being taken or uh, what can be done to improve the diagnosis of silicosis and not uh, sort of misdiagnose it with TB and vice versa, uh, not misdiagnose mis it as TB. Uh, Dr. Kaparde, would you like to say something? Yes, uh, silicosis and TB is having a lot of association and if the person is having the silicosis, especially those uh, in Rajasthan, the stone scatters and all these things, mines are there, the silicosis is a big, big, big problem and that particular silicosis is always similar to that uh, shows like tuberculosis itself and uh, if you know that uh, uh, government of India is already the Rajasthan government uh, is already doing uh, uh, intensified case finding in such cases uh, where the mines are there, silicosis mines are there and uh, we whatever the, if they have found any silicosis patient because uh, more of their relative risk for TB, TB is very very high in uh, silicosis and their symptoms is also uh, very same in such situation uh, we are link uh, if the symptoms or something symptoms are there we are linking with, with the RNTCP program and also we are monitoring through our district TB officers who is monitoring the program uh, very uh, strictly uh, with uh, in uh, such cases and special emphasis is given on this particular uh, uh, states where the uh, this specially Rajasthan and uh, um, other part where the silicosis is a big problem. Uh, the, especially the, where the mines are there in Odisha and all, where we are just special emphasizes giving to our uh, national health mission, where that health strengthening is also been given. At the same time, we will see that a factory out or mine site where there is a periodic uh, inspection or periodic screening of these pa patients are always conducting. Every six months, they have been screened out for the silicosis uh, because. Uh, because the silicosis, the tuberculosis is one of the very associated factor and uh, this is one of the very important occupational hazard uh, as far as the silicosis is concerned. 
and uh, they are definitely under the factory act the mines act a uh, lot of compensation workman compensation and all these things have been provided and periodic check for these patients are done and especially as far as the rntcp is concerned if any patient has silicosis find a tuberculosis because there is no treatment for the silicosis only the associated disease like silicosis or cancers or x y XYZ diseases associated with the silicosis has to be treated because silicosis again the major problem is the prevention. The prevention is very very important in silicosis. How we can dust of the silicosis can be reduced in that particular mindset. And uh, uh, social uh, uh, social schemes like uh, other uh, social protection schemes uh, we have to provide it them. So especially uh, nutrition and other uh, factors uh, which is very very important and uh, I'm, uh, uh, these are the certain things the government of India is also doing on the r and program. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Kapati. Uh, we have a question from Nesri Patiachi from Caprissa. Nesri would you like to ask your question? Muted. Oh. Hi. Um, yes. My question relates to HIV. We know in the Bangladesh uh, cohort there was, I think, only one patient that was HIV infected. I'm not so sure about the West African cohort. Uh, given that there isn't sufficient evidence at this point in time uh, for the safety and durability of the shortened regimen, is it safe? Is it effective to use? the shortened regimen in an HIV infected population? So I, I could just, I, I, I would just tell you the results I have from the West Africa study on, on uh, HIV uh, and I think the numbers would be larger in the stream trial. So in, in, the, uh, in the first uh, group of the four, 400 plus patients I mentioned, um, so there were 91 HIV positive patients uh, and the uh, treatment success rate was 74 percent among HIV positives. Um, so uh, you know you, you know um, very well the, the higher mortality rate in this group anyway there were 18 percent uh, who died uh, in that uh, 91 of the 91 patients treated in the regimen. Um, so the, those are the results from the West Africa study uh, and obviously the stream trial hopefully will give a better assessment of, of the regimen. Um, as for specific recommendations in that population, I don't know if uh, Dr. Fouad wants to add anything further. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rusin. I, I just can add uh, uh, um, that uh, indeed the, 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 the evidence is fairly scarce uh, on the uh, um, Indian HIV combined treating patients with HIV, uh, but there are some there is some evidence, and therefore uh, it, it was concluded that uh, the, this regimen can be used for, for that population also. We are looking for obviously for, for further data on that, but uh, except of just a few drugs, this, this regimen is mostly the, the, uh, the um, first and second line. Uh, uh, TB medicines, so there should not be many surprises there. And uh, also, we should take into account two other things. One, that uh, the HIV uh, patients uh, are at great danger of a uh, very unfavorable outcome in terms of uh, they, they may die from that combination of these two diseases. And also, should keep in mind that the, the recommendations, uh, as I said, is a conditional recommendation with a very low uh, uh, in the evidence, so it should be taken into account. Thank you to both of you. Uh, we have uh, Zelike Vaga from Ghana who wants to ask a question. Uh, Zelike, are you there? Zelike, would you like to ask your question? Zelike wants to know why we call it a nine month regimen, the Bangladesh MDR TB treatment regimen. Why do we call it a nine month regimen 
while in practice majority of the patients finish their treatment after 12 months only I, I mean i think that's a, that's a good question it's a bit of a it's a bit of a misnomer i think it's always been called the 9 month regimen because of uh, uh the the shortest possible option for patients who are who are treated successfully uh is 9 months um and and so that's caught on but but you're very uh the the uh, question asked is 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 very uh, valid that uh, that uh, in many cases it's uh, extended uh, up up uh, beyond nine months. Thank you, uh, but that is the best scenario we can expect. So and let's hope we'll move on to that eventually for all patients. Uh, we have Mariam Romani from MSF who wants to ask a question. Mariam. Mariam from MSF. Dr. Shukla, I, I just to say I, I have to drop off shortly for another meeting. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. 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 Thank, thank you very much for being there. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mariam wants to know if the gene expert will become a first test in the diagnostic cascade for TB detection in general, considering the high MDR TB prevalence. This question is directed to Dr. Khapardi. Now, I'm repeating the question. Yeah. If the gene expert will become a first test in the diagnostic cascade for DP detection in general. Yeah. Uh, definitely this uh, gene expert if become the upfront or the first test for the detection of the MDR-TB. Definitely will improve the number of cases that we can detect the more number of uh, uh, MDR and uh, especially RR cases and also MDR cases and that uh, these MDR cases can be very well uh, where new cases uh, we can just go for the short uh, uh, short regimen also short term regimen also so this will be definitely help uh, the program and government of India has already purchased now a 500 gene expert and each districts is having the one uh, attached with the uh, each districts means each districts is having the, this uh, uh, network of uh, this gene expert and they can the patient can be upfront especially extra pulmonary TB, TB, pediatric TB and suspect MDR TB cases are also been upfronted for this particular gene expert and that will definitely uh, improve our diagnostic uh, algorithm and also improve the more and more case detection of the MDR cases and also uh, th yes yeah. thank you Dr. Kaparte but I also want to know right, right now it is not being used upfront for all uh, uh, TB yeah, we patients are as the first uh, PLHIV, pediatrics, uh, um, EPTB that is the extra pulmonary TB as smear negative okay. this we are already using as upfront yes. uh, uh, Upfront uh, expert. Okay, uh, we have Alice Tembe from Swaziland. Alice, would you like to ask your question? Alice Tembe from Swaziland. Alice mm -hmm. wants. Is Alice there? Alice wants to know uh, that her concern is accessibility of the new regimen for people who are at the lower rung of economic ladder uh, and how soon and when can that the new regimen reach them, those who are actually most in need of it. Would somebody answer that question? Oh, uh, accessibility. This is Maybe before before I leave because I need to leave. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, please, 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 please. I will try. Uh, I, I'm not sure uh, exactly what what uh, um, this question is aimed at, uh, towards, but the, in terms of the access to, to this regimen, um, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's eligibility. Those patients that are eligible to be put on this regimen, they actually may get a better access because it's 
shorter uh, regimen, they uh, have uh, more opportunities to actually complete the, the whole regimen and uh, the, uh, uh, the total treatment uh, in terms of drugs might be uh, cheaper, uh, but as well as uh, uh, for the health systems, it might, might be less uh, difficult to manage because, uh, because of the, uh, the, the half of the time that is required for the completion of, of this regimen. So overall, I think when compared with the conventional regimen, if patient is eligible for the shorter regimen, it might be easier to, to, to bear both for the patient and for, for the health system in, 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 in one particular country. Over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we, the questions are still streaming in, but we have already exceeded the time limit by 10 minutes. So my apologies, we are running out of time. So we would like to close this webinar now. Uh, Participants can send their questions directly to the panelists. We'll share their email IDs with you, so you can ask them directly. And uh, we are really grateful to our panelists and to all our participants for being with us on this very important webinar. Good day to all of you, and thank you very much. <laughs>